Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church in Cincinnati. I'm Pastor Greg Enterline. I encourage you to check out our resources, other resources on our YouTube page or at our Facebook page or our website, www.gracemen.org. Thank you for joining us for our worship service. If you'd like to have the bulletin to follow along, it's posted on our website for a while. Um, and we have a couple of announcements before we get started. First of all, we are excited to announce that we will be opening up services next week, May 31st, at both our 9 and 11.15 a.m. worship services. And we're looking forward to that. Having said that, of course, there's going to be some changes. And some of those include um, that uh, we will be not passing out offering, but there will be an offering box in the back of both worship services that you can drop off your offering at either time. Or, of course, you can take advantage of our online giving, uh, which you can do remotely from your home at 3 a.m. in the morning if you'd like. We will also maintain a six feet plus distance and during out, throughout the service and uh, pews will be marked upstairs so that every third, we, we're sitting no closer than every third pew and uh, we'll be spreading out the seating. We also ask you, of course, to use your own um, common sense uh, when, as we communicate and are excited to see one another again uh, but we do ask that I uh, ask you to respect other people's space knowing that even if you feel comfortable getting close they may not and so we uh, be respectful of our brothers and sisters in Christ and our fellow worshipers. Masks and hand sanitizers will be available for use and I ask you to please consider wearing a mask if you're able. I uh, know that not everyone will be wearing masks or is not able to wear masks for a variety of reasons, but it, help, it does help us mitigate risk when more people are wearing masks, so I ask you to consider uh, doing that. This first week, May 31st, there will be no communion as we just kind of get back into the groove, but on June 7th, uh, for those who would like to receive communion, we will be offering it, although that will also be in a slightly different, a more careful and socially distant manner as well. Happy Memorial Day and we, especially on this day, give thanks to all those who have made sacrifices for the welfare of others, uh, which reminds us also especially of the sacrifice of our Lord for us. Keep those in our armed forces and those overseas in your prayers today. Uh, thank you for joining us for worship today. Our order of service is in your bulletin. We'll begin with our opening hymn, Christ is Our Cornerstone. <laughs>
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our hope is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father, for you live and reign with him in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading and the basis for our message is from Acts chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper rooms where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas turned aside to go his own, to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from 1 Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. For if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, 
what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, that let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that, every, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. And I have come to know in truth that I, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for these whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the sermon hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I know you've felt that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. As you return home from the grocery store, you're in a good place emotionally. You're excited about your fresh produce or a favorite snack until tragedy strikes. A wet spot at the bottom of your refrigerator bag. Upon further investigation, it was just as you had feared. One of your eggs is cracked and is no good. Even though that egg cost you less than two dimes, your disappointment feels much more significant. You were supposed to be coming home with a dozen eggs, and now you're left with only 11. Something is missing, and now your good grocery vibes are disrupted, and the trip seems like a failure. Well, if that's how you feel about eggs, imagine how the Holy Spirit felt when he ended up with only 11 disciples instead of the original dozen. Although I guess since it's the Holy Spirit, the analogy might be something more like this. The Holy Spirit wisely checked his eggs before purchasing, and when he found one of the original 12 all cracked and dirty, he went and replaced that broken disciple with a new one. Okay, so maybe that's a bit more cavalier of an attitude than God had about the 12 apostles, but the same basic principle still applies. Just like you're supposed to have 12 good eggs when you go to the grocery store, you're supposed to have 12 good apostles when you restart Israel. But what's with the number 12, right? Now, I don't know why exactly God originally picked 12, but it, 12 is clearly a very important and significant number for God's people. Uh, here's some simple proof. People interpret revelations in a stunning variety of ways. But almost everyone agrees that the number 12 means something specific. It means it's symbolic of fullness and completeness. You can find that for Lutherans, Catholics, uh, Baptists, all kinds of people agree on that. The number 12 is, after all, really significant in the Old Testament. When Consider this, when the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was making a new nation, the family became a true nation when there were 12 sons of Jacob. It kind of makes sense from a numbers perspective. Could you really call Isaac uh, one son, uh, an Abramite? Or when you, Isaac had Jacob and Esau, could you, could you really call a couple of bickering twins the Isaac nation? Seems like a bit of a stretch. However, once you can field a full football team plus a kicker, well, that's another story. Nowadays, a family of five kids seems big. A family of 12 could be referred to as a new nation without too much hyperbole. Thereafter, the uh, promise of the people of God would describe themselves as, the, pe the promised people of God would describe themselves as Israelites, further designating themselves one of the tribes of Israel. When a census is taken, it's by tribes. Your, uh, when even in Israel's civil war, the split happened along tribal lines. And that's why Jesus chose 12 disciples in large part. Ever since that civil war, the split between the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes, the once proud nation had been splintered and incomplete. Now, blame could be laid on both sides, including some poor leadership by the grandson of King David, Rehoboam of the southern kingdom, uh, the two tribes. With, however, the divorce was clearly outside God's will, and while both sides had done wrong, it also is quite clear that the northern tribe, the kingdom of Israel, has fallen further from the path than Judah. Because they refused to worship where God told them to. They came up with their own ideas instead of following the clear instructions of the Lord. You see, they feared it would be bad for them politically, even though it was a direct violation of God's command to only worship in the temple. This sad blight on Israel's history was made even worse uh, when the nor 10 northern tribes got so far away from Yahweh that he did not step in to save them, 
when the brutal Assyrian Empire decimated and deported the ten northern tribes. When this took place around 722 BC, the ten northern tribes, they were, they were basically erased from history. They were forcibly exiled to a new country and they, uh, by design, by Assyrian design, they lost hold of their previous political and religious identity. Uh, you know how disappointing it is to have one bad egg in a dozen, but this now is like opening the egg carton and having ten bad eggs and two barely salvageable eggs left. Uh, I bring that all up because it's the key to answering the question, why twelve apostles? There had originally been twelve tribes, but by Jesus' day, tragically, there were no descendants of the ten northern tribes left, or even if there were some descendants left, they probably were scattered throughout the world, they no longer had any idea that they were descended from Israel, and it certainly wasn't important to them anymore. The plan, you see, had gone terribly wrong. I imagine Abraham asking Yahweh, I thought you said I'd be the father of many nations, but there's barely one tribe left. Plus, they are regularly persecuted and dominated. They deserve it, I know, but still, I thought you promised. What gives? Well, Jesus demonstrates uh, the answer. God's promise to Abraham was good, but first uh, the plan had to fail uh, so that the world could realize it would only come through God's power and grace, not through man's effort. Jesus teaches that identity as God's people is no longer based on lineage, but on repentance and trust. Twelve apostles symbolizes that God is bringing those, that divorced people, those ten tribes who had been separated, he's bringing them back together. His plan is finally coming to fruition. Uh, there's enough consistency with what is happening to recognize that this is God's people. Um, the, the, this is not some new plan, even if it is a New Testament. That's a key difference. It's, it's not a new plan, even if it is a new phase in the plan. It's the second and the permanent half of God's plan. It's the same God who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the same Savior who was with the children of Israel in the wilderness, who led the twelve tribes into the promised land. The testament, the method, the terms of the agreement are new, but this is the same God. Although it's certainly a new thing, it's not at all inconsistent with what he's done before for Israel. Not just in the number 12, but in the whole character, the values, the compassion that are all still there. However, it, it is more. Version 2.0. And since he's dealing with human beings, now we're getting to Judas finally, there's bound to be some resistance. Now it was always about God's loving faithfulness. Um, repeatedly, Yahweh says that the reason he's done all this is not because Israel is inherently better than anyone else. Rather, it's simply God's plan of salvation. God is faithful to his promises to his people long after his people have stopped being faithful to him. And so God tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 26, uh, when they first harvest their crops from the promised land, the Israelites are instructed to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and they're told, they're given a liturgy, you might say, of what to say. They remember how God rescued them from Egypt by saying, and here's a, an expert, uh, excerpt, I can't pronounce that, my father was a wandering Aramean, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You see, the emphasis is not upon how great Israel is, but God's plan of salvation depends upon Yahweh, not upon us. And that's why the replacement of Judas is good news. In fact, it's wonderful and amazing proof that God's new plan cannot be stopped. Don't, don't get distracted by the special effects and the gore. Remember what Judas did and represented. He betrayed Jesus and attempted to do, undo everything Jesus stood for. He had handed Jesus over to death. He was instrumental in helping Jesus' enemies who attempted to destroy and did manage to kill Jesus. But Acts chapter 1 points something simple out. 
Judas is dead, but Jesus is not. Judas's plans fell apart, but the Holy Spirit, his plans are still moving forward. Even though the other apostles, too, failed Jesus, Jesus still forgave them and set them out to complete a mission for which they could take no credit. God's plan of salvation outlasts opposition and circumstances. It's more resilient than our faltering lips and imperfect faithfulness. There there were 12 tribes, and so there will be 12 apostles. Even though God's own people sometimes rebel and threaten God's plan, as Judas did, God will still see to the care of his greater people. His plan of salvation can't be stopped. Judas is replaced because God's plan is too big to be left unattended to. The new people of God will be completed. I I heard a song on way over here, uh, a a contemporary praise song about God's going to get the victory. uh, uh, It says something like, uh, the battle belongs to the Lord, and uh, you you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it to good. Well, Judas... And this new, this new apostleship is exactly uh, an example, a prime example of that. Judas and the enemies of God's people have this grand plan, but God uses it for his plan of salvation. And that's why you and I are still here today. Not because of us. No human being, no human could decision, not even if we were to betray or step away from the faith, would God's plan stop. God will always ensure that his message, that you, his people, that his plan of salvation will continue. We are a new people, the new people of God, whose identity is not based on genealogical descent from one of the 12 tribes of Israel or simply because our parents were Christians, but we are rather connected by faith, by repentance and trust in the good news of Jesus. So have no fear. Nothing in all creation could stop God's plan for his people. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the offertory. continue with the prayers of the church. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your plans do indeed take place regardless of what happens around us, and we hold on to that and remember that in the midst of of, uh, all that goes on in the world around us. Uh, We thank you that you are taking care of us wherever we are, whatever happens. We pray that uh, you would be with us at Grace Lutheran Church and as we reopen, and we pray that you should be with churches uh, around the U.S., as many are uh, considering reopening. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to give a, a, a bold and faithful witness. And also, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be um, conscientious and responsible, uh, and uh, at, least as, at least as careful and considerate of others as the world around us, so that we might give a witness, um, not only that we care about life, but Uh, that uh, connecting to you is essential uh, to our well-being. Uh, We pray that you watch over us in all our decisions and actions as a congregation as we go forward, um, and uh, we we pray that you watch over all individuals too, all the members of Grace, and uh, that you would strengthen them and help them as uh, they make decisions. And Lord, uh, we we pray that you would help us support them uh, whatever the decision may be, whether it be to continually worshiping at home, which is 
probably the right choice for some individuals, uh, or worshiping in person. Lord, we pray that you help us to stay united and to be supporting one another as we find our support in you, our Lord and Savior. We pray on this memorial weekend, may the example of those who sacrificed even sometimes laying down their lives for the protection of others, remind us of your truly perfect selfless love and sacrifice. Uphold and strengthen those that serve in any of the branches of our armed services so that they may be faithful, upright, and provide protection and intervention when necessary. Humble us so that we do not take our material possessions, freedoms, or privileges for granted, but remind us to be good stewards of these gifts and ever grateful to others and especially to you, O Lord. Be especially with those, all those serving our country and those especially close to our congregation, uh, including but not limited to Tanner Bender, uh, Michael Lee, Andy Goff, Craig Martin, Joe Miller, uh, Dylan Mitchell, Jeff Schweppe, Nick Stern, Nolan and Ross Wollenweber, and all others, Lord. Again, we pray that you would give them strength for, for tasks that they may have, and we pray that you would and watch over them in body, mind, and spirit. We also pray that you be with all missionaries uh, overseas in particular, uh, uh, the, Rus- the Ruskies and Esla family, as well as the Wood family and all others. Lord, it's, uh, I know it's been particularly hard on some of these folks, and uh, we thank you for their willingness to be in already um, challenging circumstances, made much more so uh, during these times. And we pray that you would sustain them and watch over them, and especially watch over their families, keep them safe, and give them uh, your presence and and comfort. Be also this week with all those whom we mention in prayer, and especially in need of your care and concern, be especially with Belinda Oberding. Uh, We pray that you be also with uh, Krista Bredehoff, Ruth Thomas, uh, Billy Beinkemper, Elaine Cheesebrew, Dave and Linda Isley, Becky Cannonberg, Linda McCabe, Terry McCabe, Nancy Niehaus, Donna Nimmo, Lester Rampage, Ken Ross, Hugh Schaefer, uh, Rita Sohn, Becky Stamper, David Stamper, Ruth Thomas, and Clyde Wallenweber, and Esther Goldfuss. Heavenly Father, you know all these, your lambs, and we pray that you would watch over them in body, mind, and spirit, and that you would, if it be your will, would have mercy upon them, and uh, Lord, that you would Uh, send an extra measure of your peace and protection and send your holy angels to watch over them. Be with our nation's leaders at every level. Um, The reality is that this is no fun for anyone to be making decisions at a time like this. And uh, we pray that you would give all leaders in government, business, and in families and in your church wisdom, patience, and strength as uh, they make decisions. Be with those affected by illness, including... uh, all those affected by COVID-19, give comfort to those who are ill and send your presence to those who have lost loved ones. We pray for your help and mercy. If it be your will, help us to understand and fight this disease and allow loved ones and friends to be reunited in person in in your time, O Lord. Be with those undergoing difficult times that are made worse by mitigating circumstances, including the shutdown. Be especially with those struggling with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Uh, With children and teens who are cooped up, with uh, those who are affected negatively by the economic fallout, and uh, with all of us, Lord, to some to varying extents, affected uh, in in terms of our our mental and emotional well-being by all that's going on. Uh, We pray that you would comfort us, that you, in all of this, that you would be our comfort and stay. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us an extra dose of that comfort and presence uh, to sustain and and strengthen us. Help uh, help them, Lord, and show us how we can help others as well. These and all other prayers we bring before you, Heavenly Father, knowing that you hear them for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>